Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give a praise and honor to Jehovah God and thanking him for all of our lives and this opportunity that he has given us to worship before him, Amen. to call upon him on this holy day. Amen. We are grateful to the creator of the heavens and the earth for, the, for all of our lives, Amen. for teaching us his commandments, statutes, and judgments, allowing us this opportunity to open up his word and to be able to study his word Amen. on this day. Thanking him for letting us know that we are the children of Israel which allows us to have a special place in the presence of the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one that made all things, the one that sees all things, the one to whom there is nothing impossible for him to do. So he is the one that watches over us, protects us, guided us throughout the week, allowed us the opportunity to make it here on this day to worship before him. So we acknowledge the God that created the heavens and the earth that in the beginning we read about in the book of Genesis and all throughout the Holy Scriptures, which is also known as the Old Testament, but we acknowledge that Jehovah is the king of the universe, that created the heavens and the earth, and that there is none with him, there was none before him, and there will be none after him. He's the one that is responsible for our lives once again. He's the one that's responsible for our food, our clothing, our shelter. Everything that we have, we acknowledge, it comes from him and him alone. And again, thanking him for allowing us to rest our mind and our body on this day. For he has taught us to remember this, the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For we acknowledge that in six days he made the heavens and the earth and ceased from all his work on the seventh day. And also for the children of Israel, we remember that he is the one that brought us out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage with his strong hand and with his outstretched arm. And this is the season that we are approaching even during this time, which is known as Passover, or said, pronounced as Pesach in the Hebrew language where we acknowledge the season that is approaching, which, which signifies the deliverance that the Most High brought upon the children of Israel in delivering us out of that land during this season. So many generations ago, during this season, there were the nine plagues that have already taken place. And now we are awaiting that final plague, that 10th plague, that 10th sign, that 10th wonder that the Most High was going to display upon, the, upon Egypt, passing over all of the homes and saving us alive during that season. And after that, then we know that Pharaoh sent the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But at this time, we are going to go into the book of Psalms, which is later on in the history of the children of Israel after entering, or after coming out of Egypt, dwelling in the desert for 40 years, allowing or being allowed to enter into the land of Canaan, being able to dwell within that land, being able to be established within that land, being able to be protected by the Most High in that land, that generations even after that, there was a man named King David who became king over all of Israel. And the Most High watched over him. Amen. He made mistakes, he committed sins, as we will read about with this first psalm that we're going to get into. And he knew who to, who to make his confession to when he sinned, when he, made, when he committed iniquity, when he committed his transgression. He knew who he was going to make his confession to in order to obtain forgiveness or obtain some, some level of pardon for the things that he did. So we are going to start with Psalm 51. Again, this is written by... It's attributed to King David, and we're going to start from the beginning of Psalm 51. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A Psalm of Dawid, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So, dealing in the history, before we see what King David wrote, dealing with the history, what happened or what preceded David, or what preceded when Nathan, the prophet, what preceded the, the prophet Nathan going to King David after King David went into Bathsheba? What preceded this? Or anybody can just give a brief, run, a brief rundown of the history that led up to why the prophet Nathan had to go to speak to King David. He committed a sin. He got, mm-hmm. 
Okay. So now, yeah. So now more of the, the history came out, right? He committed murder and adultery in mm-hmm. the same day. Or well, same time. Maybe not the same day. Because remember, she got pregnant, time went by, right. and then he... Um, yeah. <laughs> so as, as the history dictates, this is the time of year. This should be Second Samuel chapter 12. Just to verify that. We're not going to read that because we're still in Psalm 51. But it should be Second Samuel chapter 12. Go there. Just want to verify that those are the, that's the chapter it starts from. And actually, no, tw- it started in chapter 11. 12 is where what happened when Natan the prophet actually approached King David. So in Second Samuel chapter 11, it was a t- time of, and it came to pass at the return of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David tarried at Jerusalem. So this was a time of year. There was a war going on. Now, kings of nations in times past used to go forth into war along with the army, as opposed to di- today where you see heads of nations sit back and don't go forth to war. They just dictate what's going what's to happen. So, again, if you think about all of the kings throughout history and within the nation of Israel, even abroad, all of these kings were what they would, know to, would be known as warring kings. Just as even in the history of the United States, you had um, George Washington was also part of the war. But somewhere along the line, presidents started getting lax. Like, imagine if Biden was going to war right now. As if all the other presidents, presidents in times past was doing, going forth to war. Imagine again, that was like sort of a prerequisite that you had to display some sort of fierceness, being able to loot, loot, lead the trips, troops, lead the troops in battle, being able to do a lot of things, being multifaceted. That was part of um, leadership. Mm-hmm. And again, after a period of time, somewhere along the line, presidents start to fall back and send the army to war. So, because it's easy to sit back and just send other people to war. Right. As opposed to if you know that you're going to be part of the war, the decision process may be a little bit different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because you know that you're not, you're not just putting the lives of other people at risk, you're putting your own life at risk as well. Right. And then again, your decision process may be a little bit different. You may decide that you're not going to do certain things. You're not going to start certain wars. You're not going to retaliate a certain way. You're going to find a different way or a different method to do certain things because you're actively involved in all aspects of the nation. Mm-hmm. But again, that's not what So we see that in 2 Samuel chapter 11, King David was, he, for whatever reason, he stayed back. People went out to war. And then that's where the chain of events start to take place, where he's walking on his rooftop. He sees. He looks down. He sees a woman bathing, and he inquires who's the woman that who who that is that he saw bathing, and it was told to him that it was Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, and that didn't stop him. He had her sent to him. He laid with her. She got pregnant. After a period of well, after a period of time, when she found that she was pregnant, she sent the message to King David, and then because she was married. And as the part of the history that um, Lakemia is bringing up, that he had Uri- that King David had Uriah, who was her husband, killed in a war because Uriah was also a part of he was one of the troops. But he also before that, actually before that, what did he do? What did King David try to do? Before he just tried to before he just killed. Right. Right, she sent, he sent for Uriah to come back from the war in order that he would go home with his wife, lay with his wife, and then he could just, the world would be like, oh, that's just, they married, she got pregnant, that's Uriah's baby. And what did Uriah do? Went and sat on David's uh, footbed. Right, he just stayed with the local troops and wouldn't go home, and King David tried to get him, said, go, and Uriah said, no. My peoples, well, not my peoples, because he's a Hittite. My fellow warriors are out there fighting. How am I going to just come back and just go lay with my wife when, right, when everybody's fighting? That's a, the mark of a true warrior. Isn't that? He's not thinking about himself and his own comfort. He's thinking about everybody else. How can I go home with my wife when things are happening abroad? So think about the minds of 
certain individuals. So then that's why King David said, all right, you don't want to go to your wife, go back to the war. And he sent him back to the war with a death sentence in his own hand because he sent him with a letter to give to Joab, who was leading the troops. Joab read the letter, which said, put Uriah the Hittite in the fiercest part of the battle, up in the front. Mm -hmm. And when the battle gets hot, pull away from him, mm -hmm. leave him out there right. to get killed. And that's how Uriah the Hittite um, was murdered. But also, other people got caught up in that as well. So it wasn't Uriah the Hittite alone that was killed or was murdered, so to speak, depending on how you look at it, other people. So how one transgression led to other things and caused lives, caused physical lives to be destroyed, and then the actual, you know, just history changing and just life changing for a lot of people. And then King David, after, the wife, after her husband was dead, took Bathsheba to himself and... The baby was born. Well, this is actually after the fact. Well, the baby was born, and the baby died. But within the midst of that, which is 2 Samuel chapter 12, Natan the prophet went to King David and gave him a parable saying that, you know, that there was a man. He had just one lamb, and he took care of it. There was another man who had flocks and everything like that, and he took that one person there just to paraphrase the parable so we can get into the psalm. And what should be done to that man that took that individuals one lamb and then King David said that that individual should put to death and then not time the prophet said that man is you because and then the message that God gave to not the prophet said that he gave King David everything that he wanted he had he was in charge of the people he had wives he had money he had everything at his disposal but yet he just wanted that man's wife which caused a lot of things to transpire so after that King David repented and throughout the midst of that, that's how we get this psalm right here. Hallelujah. Verse 2. Verse 3. Be gracious unto me, O Yah, according to thy mercy, according to the multitude of thy compassions, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done that which is evil in thy sight that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest and be in the right when thou judgest. So King David is asking the Most High to be gracious unto him according to the mercy that he can display unto King David. So after King David realized this, or you know, received this message from Natan the prophet about his own death sentence, or in what the punishment was going to be is that the sword would never depart out of the house of David forever. And that the child that Bathsheba was, you know, had at that time will die. And again, that's why you see the term, that child died after he you know, was born, that child died. And then King David saw the turmoil and the problems that his household had even while he was alive. He had one of his sons rape his daughter. He had one of his sons usurp the kingdom away from him. He's seen a lot of problems in his life after that. So we also have to consider the things that we do in our lives that can be a chain reaction to the various problems that we see in our lives. And it's nothing to the level that King David was able to experience that many of us may not have been able to bear what King David was able to bear in his own lifetime, but yet the actions that we perform can cause a chain reaction to other things in our lives. So we have to be very careful of the things that we do. And he acknowledged that the sins that he committed was, even though it was a sin of adultery and it was a sin of murder, which was something that was done against another individual, or other individuals were involved in that, King David said that it was before Jehovah God alone that he sinned. And he's acknowledging his trans transgressions before Jehovah God alone. He's asking Jehovah God to cleanse him of these, because he's the only one that can cleanse. We don't have anybody that is in between us and the Most High that can intercede for us whenever we're doing wrong or even when we're doing right. We, have to, we are able to pray directly to the one that created the heavens and the earth. And that's what separates the way of life that the Most High, the Creator of the Heavens and the Earth has given us compared to what other people follow. That we have a direct line to the one that created all things, that we can pray to him and he can hear all of our prayers in all places at all times. There was nothing impossible for the Most High to do. So whenever you find yourselves in, a, in any type of problem, you are able to take it directly to the Most High and he's the one that can deliver you out of that. And even if you sin before the Most High, Go before him and confess your iniquities, transgressions, and sins before him, and before him only. Continue. Behold, at the seventh verse, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, 
thou desirest truth in the inward parts, make me therefore to know wisdom in my innermost heart. So before we continue, because he's saying, before behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin that my mother conceived me, meaning that as a human being, we have sin upon us even from when we're born. That sin is always around us. As God told Cain that sin couches at the door, but he, was able to, but he would have been able to rule over it if he chose to do so. So in that being born in iniquity is the fact that as human beings, we are prone to sin. It's as we read in the book of Genesis that we got, before God flooded the entire earth, he said the mind of man is continually evil at all times, meaning that as a human being. So it's not that his mother was sinful, and, you know, because that, that's the question that comes up in terms of how is it that he made the statement that sin that my mother conceived me. It's just as a human being, we are prone to sin, but we have the ability to rule over those sins. And he continued, by, he continued that by saying that the Most High desires truth in the inward parts, meaning that within our own selves, we have to be truthful. We have to be truthful with ourselves and truthful before the Most High because we cannot hide anything from the Most High. Everything that we think about, everything that we say, and everything that we do is before him at all times. So we are able to hide the truth and, and, and lie. No, we are able to lie before other people, but the Most High sees the difference between the truth and the lie at all times. So that's why he said that, the most I desire is the truth in the inward parts. Again, be true to yourself. Be true to your real self. And then the most high can hopefully purge you as he was we read about in this next verse. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. So, and again, this is a parable that he's, he's saying at this time to because hyssop is one of the things that people will utilize to clean or the purge, it was like, and also he said wash so that he'd be white in the snow. We can have something that's d dirty or soiled, that if you want it to be clean, like white garments, you, you know, you take all that dirt out, that's when he's making that reference to being whiter than snow. And he wants the Most High to clean him from within, because the Most High sees what's within him. So even with the sin that King David p committed, he was, as we read in the history from, from 2 Samuel chapter 12, that even though he was punished for it. It wasn't the punishment to the level that anybody else would have received because King David was able to spill his guts, so to speak, before the Most High, and he was really and truly sorry for what he did. It doesn't mean that we as human beings should emulate King David because the Most High knows us before times. Because some people read the life of King David and say, well, if King David was able to commit adultery and commit murder and be forgiven for it, then I should be able to do all types of things to be forgiven, but that's not how the most high, because you already premeditated some of the wrongs that you're going to do, thinking that you're going to be forgiven, just like King David was forgiven. But King David was also punished. We're not, we're not going to escape judgment. Having mercy put up, you know, brought upon us means that you may not get the full extent, so the full brunt of the judgment at one time. Mm -hmm. But when you do wrong, it doesn't mean that you're not, or that you're going to escape any type of judgment. So he's asking the most high to purge him and to clean him. And to make him, because after he heard the depth or heard the sentence was going to be upon him, that's how his bones, as he's speaking in the parable, that his bones were feeling crushed. But he wants to have, he wants to be able to rejoice once again, and he's asking the Most High to help him to get to that level. Continue. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create a clean heart, O Yah, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy holy spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and let a willing spirit uphold me. So there was a question, and there was a question a, a few, probably a few months back, in terms of, and this actually might help to answer that question. There was a question that came up in terms of spirituality. But what King, King David is acknowledging, he said he wants the Most High to create within him a clean heart or a clean mind. The word in Hebrew would actually you know, could also mean mind and to renew that spirit within him that would cause him to be steadfast, to cause him to stay in the path of righteousness continually, because King David realized that whatever spirit was upon him that caused him to do wrong, he wants that taken away from him, and he wants that spirit that would cause him to be steadfast. Mm -hmm. And he says he doesn't want to be cast away from the presence of the Most High, because whenever we do wrong, it can cause us to be put away from the presence of the Most High. And once you're away from the presence of the Most High, then there's nothing that can save you. Because again, there is no intercessor between us and the Most High. So he doesn't want to be removed from the presence of the Most High. And he said, do not take that Holy Spirit away from me. The Holy Spirit is not an entity 
that is separate from God and is actually not an a entity by itself. It's just a, a spirit that the Most High could put into an individual that would cause them to be holy. Mm -hmm. But it is not God. Because we live in a world today where people you know, act, or consider that the Holy Spirit is some sort of separate entity. But the, a spirit that comes from God is still coming from God. And it's not a, everything we, all of our attention, all of the things that we direct goes to the creator of the heavens and the earth only. And he said, let a willing spirit uphold him. He wants to be in the presence of the Most High and he wants to be willing to serve the Most High. And as we're reading these things, these are also the actions that we can take on for ourselves as well, that we want to be willing to serve the Most High to where it's not something that we feel compelled against our own will to serve the Most High, but instead we're doing something that the Most High wants us to do. See, he wants that willing spirit to uphold him. And then he will be able to do this. Then, at the 15th verse, will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall return unto thee. So we have to be clean before we can go forth and talk about other people and their transgressors and their sins. Because King David has a, has a state of mind at this time that he realized that as a king over the entire nation, he's also in the seat of judgment. That's also one of his responsibilities. He's a leader in the, in the battlefield. He's also a leader when it comes to judgment. That whenever there's a case that is too difficult for, for judges below him to handle, all of those cases get brought to King David, and he's the one that has to be or sit in the seat of judgment in order to judge people. But he can't be in the seat of judgment telling transgressors about their ways and telling sinners that they're doing something wrong when he has these things upon him. So he acknowledged the Most High. He said, take away all these sins and iniquity from me, put a clean spirit within me and a holy spirit within me and a steadfast spirit within me, then I would be able to teach transgressors your ways. And then I would be able to help sinners turn away from their evil ways and return to you. Continue. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou rock of my salvation, so shall my tongue sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Jehovah, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall declare thy praise. For thou delightest not in sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou hast no pleasure in burnt offering. The sacrifices of Yah are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O Yah, thou will not despise. And this is during a time where the temple, or the, this was the tent of meeting was in place. You had priests out of the line of Aaron, which were performing sacrifices. So King David had the ability and the means with the animals that he had uh, um, possession of, the money that he had. He, he could have just presented some offerings to the Most High. But the Most High does not, cannot be bribed. Right. So that's why he's saying that, he does, that he's saying that the Most High does not delight in sacrifice, else he would give it. These are not the things that the Most High desires in. We read in the book of Jeremiah, I also be read it when it, the Haftar was in conjunction with the beginning of the book of Waikra, that the Most High didn't command it about burnt offerings and, and any of that. He, instead, he prefers that we have a willing spirit to serve him. Mm -hmm. It's all about following the commandments, statutes, and judgments. It's not about the sacrifice because people think that they can do wrong and just pay God off. And we also read when it, with the king that was prior to King David was King Saul, when he did wrong, and he was talking about the people wanted to bring these animals back from the Amalekites to bring an offering, Samuel said that um, obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen. So it's not about what you can do because, you, again, you can't bribe God. You can't pay him more for anything. God, prefer, or the, the Most High, prefers that, as he said in the end of that section I just read, that he prefers a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Those are the things that he will not despise, and those are the things that he desire instead. Continue. Do good in thy good favor unto Zion at the 20th verse. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then will thou delight in the sacrifices of righteousness and burnt offerings and hold offerings. Then will they offer bullocks upon thine altar. So when the sacrifices are being presented, it's being presented by those that are living righteously. Their sacrifices are a supplement to righteousness. The, the, the sacrifices are a supplement to living in according to the commandments, statutes, and judgment of the Most High. It's not something that is done in place of. It's something that's done in addition to living right and being good before the Most High. So that's why King David, at the end of this, is saying that after he's cleaned up, mm -hmm. that Holy Spirit is put within him, that contrite spirit is put within him, that right. willing spirit, that steadfast spirit is put within him, right. then he will be able to present the offer because now he's living in a righteous path, the path that the Most High truly desires for him to walk in. Then he can do those supplementary acts which is the sacrifices which the Most High will only accept from righteous individuals. Now we're going to go into Psalm 52. 52. Hallelujah. For the leader, Mashkil of Melech Dawid, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Melech 
Shaul and said unto him, Dawid is come to the house of Abimelech. So Abimelech. It, does anybody know that history? Where Doeg the Edomite came to Saul, who was king at this time. So Psalm 52 takes place, or the history of Psalm 52 takes place before the history of Psalm 51. Because 52 is, of course, when King Saul is still alive and David was anointed, but he was not sitting on the throne, of course, because King Saul was still there, and he was actually on the run from King Saul. Yeah. So what is the history that has taken place that where Doeg the Edomite was telling King Saul he went to the that... City. Doeg the Edomite saw the great prince in the city of Noel, mm -hmm. and Ahimelech, who was the priest at that time, provided Malek Dawid with the showbread. When he came, he was hungry. He had asked him first before he partook of the showbread, mm -hmm. have you been with any woman? He told him I hadn't, so he gave him the showbread. And he also gave him his sword that he had used to cut off the head of Goliath with. Mm -hmm. Doeg the Edomite was there. He saw Malek Dawid and Ahimelech. He saw him helping out mm -hmm. Malek Dawid, and then he took that information back, which is what I just read. Okay, King Saul. And you were going to say something? No. King, who's, who, wait, who was hiding? King Dave was hiding. Mm -hmm. And why was, why was King David hiding? That's part of it. Yeah, that happened along the way, but yeah, like. He preferred to fight. He preferred to run than to fight. I would not touch the Lord's mm -hmm. was Like, the like what was the contention between King Saul and King Saul David? Saul was jealous of him. Okay. He knew he was taking over. And why was he jealous of him? Just to put these questions out, why is he jealous? Like the, like the women had this song, David killed his tens of thousands, Saul killed, killed his thousands. And King Saul didn't like the fact that the song was attributing more deaths to King David than himself. He was jealous. Enough. Right, he was jealous. So not realizing that 10,000 plus 1,000 is still 11,000 people dead, right. he was more concerned with, well, why did they give him more wins than, than me? King. Right. And so... <laughs> As it was mentioned, so King David is on the run. He goes to the high priest, which is, who at this time was Achimelech. And Achimelech is the one that's helping King David. Doeg the Edomite happened to be there and brought message back to King Saul. This actually should be 2 Samuel chapter 22, just to, the city is known. Just to um, verify that so that when people want to go back and read about this part of the history. It should be, no, it's not 2 Samuel, because 2 Samuel is after King 1 Samuel's. It should be 1 Samuel's chapter 22. Where did this history is? So for Psalm 51, that was 2 Samuel starting from chapter 11. This is first for 52. This is 1 Samuel starting with chapter 22, where you read that history that everybody was speaking about. So was, was Doeg wrong in passing the message back to King Saul that he saw Achimelech, in, Achimelech the priest, helping David out? Was he wrong? No, he was not. Yeah. And why was he? Job. He was a judge. Anybody else? He was on, he was on Saul's payroll. Mm -hmm. Huh? <laughs> so whatever he says, you just repeat. <laughs> He would also say he would get a real reward. So, seeing that there's no other thoughts of it, the, the consensus is Doeg was not wrong in going to tell King Saul what he saw about King David. So, let's go ahead. Psalm 52. Hallelujah. 52nd Psalm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. At the third verse. Why boasted thou thyself of evil, O mighty man? The mercy of Yah endureth continually. Thy tongue divides up destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully. And he's speaking about Doag the Edomite because what also happened is that when King Saul heard that Ahimelech was giving aid to David who was on the run from him, that he went, that Doag the Edomite went back to Ahimelech, asked him some questions, 
And then what did Doeg also do after that? He. What do you mean? What did he do after that? You mean what Saul told him to do? Right. Okay. okay. That's more. <laughs> yeah. Paraphrase. When when Saul when he told Saul Saul mm -hmm. brought back his men with him. Mm -hmm. They approached Ahimelech. Right. Ahimelech said, "I didn't know he was on the run from you, my mm -hmm. lord. I didn't know he right. was innocent. He told him the truth." Right. Saul didn't believe him. Mm -hmm. So he commanded his men that was around him kill him. Mm -hmm. And the men like, "No, I'm not touching him." And so he commanded Doeg the Edomite, and Doeg killed everybody in the town. Everybody. Oh, the priests, right. All of them. Because it, it was a the town of men, priests, right. Every, he killed right. everybody, including the animals. And that's why he mentioned that that tongue divides destruction like a sharp razor working deceitfully, Hallelujah. because the word that he brought back also caused the death and destruction of the high priest and the high priest family, as it was just mentioned, within that city. So a lot of things that we speak about can also cause destruction towards other people. And that's why it's very important. So in the grand scheme of things, Doeg the Edomite was not wrong because as was mentioned, he works for King Saul. David is on the run. So we're looking at it from the perspective of how we're reading history. But at that time, King David was on the run from the actual king of the nation at that time. So he was a fugitive. So Doeg was not wrong in passing word back that he saw King David. Now, it, it got to another level when he started killing off priests. Mm -hmm. 81 to be exact. 81 priests, anointed by, which are anointed men mm -hmm. of the Most High, who is in a position to perform sacrifice and everything. So this was where that became wrong. Because right. once, you know, because everybody, as you mentioned, the other people were like, we're not touching these priests. But Doeg is the one that stood up and said, he's going to do so. And everybody else just stood around and watched this happen, which also puts them at fault anyway. So even though they didn't want to do it themselves, just watching somebody do that type of destruction also makes you complicit in that action. So that also teaches that we should not be just watching evil just happen. We are supposed to also step in and stop things from happening and not worry about the king or anybody else, but worry about what the Most High God is going to think about in that instance. Continue. And also Nathan yep. the prophet escaped and told Malek that we what happened. happened. And then King David was upset because he said, it's my fault that all of this happened. Right. Because he said, if I didn't go to Akimelech, no, Akimelech would have been still alive at this time. So he took the blame on himself for what happened. Fifth verse. Thou lowest evil more, thou lovest evil more than good. Falsehood rather than speaking righteousness. Selah. Thou lovest all devouring words, thou the deceitful tongue. Jehovah will likewise break thee forever. He will take thee up and pluck thee out of thy tent and root thee out of the land of the living. Because of the evil that was performed, because he spoke something, and then he also performed that action of killing those priests, that King David said, everything that you, that you did is going to come right back to you. So he's putting all of this out there, and what people say today, putting this out there in the atmosphere, because, again, everything that we speak about and everything that we do will always come back to for pro proverbially haunt us. Everything that we do comes back. So if you, do, if you want to receive good, you do good. If you want to receive evil, then you do evil. Mm. It's like when God told Abraham, he said, those that bless you will be blessed, those that curse you will be cursed. And that continues to happen generation after generation. So if we speak good about one, each, one, uh, one another and we bless one another, that's how we receive blessings individually. Amen. But because at times we may curse other people, put down other people, speak wrong about other people, that's why wrong things happen or what we perceive wrong things happen to us. Because of the actions that we do. We cannot be one of those people that always have something bad to say about other people, but we should be in a position where we want to uplift people. Yeah, you see people that are downtrodden and speak blessings into their life. And then the Most High in turn will bless you as a result of that because that word was already spoken that he gave to Abraham. And us being the descendants of Abraham, those words continue to be in effect even up until today. Continue. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. Lo, this is the man that made not Jehovah his stronghold, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. So as it was just mentioned, Doag was on the payroll for King Saul, so he had, and, and how close he was to King Saul, also probably he had a lot of riches as a result of that. But the riches do not save you from turmoil. It does not save you from death. It does not save you from the problems. It does not save you from sickness. It's the righteousness and the prayers that will save you when in your time of trouble. So that's why King David is saying that the righteous will see this, and in the end, it's the righteous that will see and fear, because they will see what will happen to the one that does evil, how the evil gets returned 
unto the one that does evil. And that will also teach other people to be fearful of the Most High. And instead of continuing doing the evil, be fearful of the word of the Most High and living righteously as opposed to an evil person or a wicked person that strengthens themselves in doing wickedness. But he says, But as for me, I am like a leafy olive tree in the house of Jehovah. I trust in the mercy of Jehovah forever and ever. I will give thee thanks forever because thou hast done it. And I will wait for thy name, for it is good in the presence of thy saints. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So it just, we also just have to be patient. Living a righteous life or living a good life doesn't mean that the blessings are going to come automatically. It could also be your test to know whether you're going to be steadfast, as we read in the previous song. Are you going to be steadfast in this way of life? Or are you going to be steadfast and continue to walk in this way and wait upon the salvation of the Most High? Because he said in that last portion of the verse, he said, I will wait for thy name, for it is good in the presence of thy saints. See, so he knows that in the end times of you know, his life, that just by him being patient and waiting for the Most High, good will come upon him. As opposed to that he could have just been like Doeg and said, well, Doeg did this, but I'm going to do this in retaliation. But instead, he waited for the salvation of the Most High and didn't retaliate on that level. So we might find ourselves in, in our lives dealing with negative people. But it doesn't mean that you have to be negative in return. Because you're going you're gonna to meet all types of people that would want to do something or have negative thoughts towards you. Because there's probably at least three different types of negative people. You have negative people that just don't like you, but they'll still help you because they know that you know, it's the right thing to do. They might help you just because the law says to help you. But they still are negative towards you. Then you have negative people that won't help you at all because they don't want to see you prosper. Then you have negative people that would do anything in their power to make sure that you don't succeed, so they're active in their negativity. But you encounter all these people in your lives, whether at school or whether at work or wherever it is that you may find yourself. And they said that the best revenge is prosper. prosperity, success. So just keep pushing forward in your life. Don't worry about the negativity that people are bringing towards you. Just continue to push forward in your own life become successful and prosperous, waiting upon the salvation of the Most High, and that's how you show people who you truly are. That's right. But when you waste your time on a mundane level, going back and forth with people, you would never get to see the salvation of the Most High is given, going to give to you, because you could think of it from this perspective. The Most High is able to do a better job in helping you out than you can do helping yourself. He can do a better job in stamping out the negative people in lives than you can do. But if you want to go back and forth with negative people, then you're showing the Most High that you got this and you don't need him. Mm -hmm. So instead, show the Most High that you need him and that you want him to help you. So be patient and wait for the salvation of the Most High so that the Most High can help you in, in all of your endeavors. So we give praise and honor to the Most High and thanking him for all of our lives and this opportunity that he has given us to be able to worship before him and to praise him on this holy day. And some of the questions you know, that might have been Asked, I've already been asked. At this time, we're going to do a question and answer. If anybody has any questions, we'll do what we can to answer these questions and praying that the Most High will bless us with the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding so that we will answer these answer questions in a proper manner and not lead anybody astray nor be led astray. We also are mindful that the season of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is um, quickly upon us. And that season, living, in a way, living where we live now, or living how we live now, takes some sort of preparation in terms of how we clean our homes, cleaning certain foods out, you know, out of our homes, and making our homes and everything that we possess ready for that season. Mm -hmm. So if anybody has any questions, whether here or online, people may ask those questions, and we'll do what we can to answer them. Uh, there is, there might be a, maybe, it might be a cahoots being worked on. It just wasn't ready because, you know, the idea was to have question and answer. So I know some people were um, staying behind to play cahoots. But sorry to um, burst y'all bubbles. But if anybody has any questions here online, we'll do what we can to answer them. Who's who? It, 
Yeah, her name was not. The question was who was King David's mother. Yeah, her name, from what I believe, was not mentioned. You know. Yeah. Right. Well, I don't know. So the question was, why do I think that David's mother's name was mentioned? I don't know. Okay, so we're going to go to, the question is, what makes a holy convocation and can you have one in your home? And I'm going to start off by saying, number one, that this is going to be my opinion in terms of that, because there are different um, interpretations of what a holy convocation is. Mm -hmm. And so we read in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, mm -hmm. actually also... It's in, well, it's, it's in the beginning. I just want to also get a Hebrew text as well. Because where we see um, holy convocation is a mikwa kodesh. That's the, that's the word in Hebrew, mikwa kodesh. Mikwa kodesh. And when it's plural, holy convocation is mikwa e kodesh. The Vigil 23. It's also, yes, yeah, in verse, it's also in verse 2. Just wanted to see, right? So in verse 2, it says, the, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, The appointed seasons of Jehovah, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my appointed seasons. And the appointed seasons, uh, appointed season is a mo'aid. And the mikra kodesh is the holy convocation. So I, again, I just begin by saying my opinion is in terms of the latter part of the question you are able to keep a holy convocation in your home a holy convocation <laughs> did I miss something I know but I was like the, st the, st the sentence wasn't even finished and yes Some people online miss some of these discourses that be happening. Nothing major, you know, nothing terrible or fighting. But so, in my opinion, yes, to be able to, the, the holy convocation is the day itself is holy. Or Mikra Kodesh is um, your, or the day is called holy by the Most High. So the Sabbath day is a holy convocation. It's the seventh day of every week. Then you have the other holy convocation, as it was mentioned in verse four. Said these are the appointed season of Jehovah, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in the appointed season. And so, all of these days of the year, by virtue of their dates, with the exception of Shavuot, all of these dates on the Hebrew calendar would also be holy convocations by virtue of the fact that the Most High called them to be holy. So, a holy convocation is actually the day itself being a holy day, which you can keep whether in your home or coming out to a con congregation in order to worship. So again, just giving you my opinion that the Holy Convocation is actually the day itself being called holy as opposed to um, the English translation of convocation, which refers to a gathering. It's a whole different concept when you think about it in English, but in terms of the Hebrew t concept of Mikra Kodesh, it's a holy calling. So in terms of living with people that do not observe the Feast of Eleven Bread and they may have leavened bread and certain things like that in the household, you can only control as much as you can control if you're living in a household that does not uphold that standard. It's the same thing as those that live in a household with people that don't, that don't observe Shabbat. They do the best that they can observing Shabbat, living within those households. So the same rules would apply for Passover and how that um, question comes into play because we read in Exodus chapter 12 in regards to the Feast of Eleven Bread where it says, we're going to read in Exodus chapter 12 starting with verse 14, and this day shall be unto you a memorial and you shall keep it a feast to Jehovah throughout your generations, you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. 
Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread, howbeit the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be to you a holy convocation, and in the seventh day a holy convocation. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done by you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for, it is, for in this selfsame day have I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day throughout your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eats that which is leavened, that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Whether he be a sojourner or one that is born in Israel, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations shall you eat unleavened bread. So that was Exodus chapter 12, verses 14 through 20, where it mentioned that in verse 15, put away leaven out of your houses. And also again in verse 19, it, says, it repeats that we should put away leaven from our houses. And then in Exodus chapter 13, it mentions that... Starting from verse 6, seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to Jehovah. Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy borders. So in 13, it mentions all of your borders, and in Exodus chapter 12, it mentions your houses. So anything that you are in control of, your house, your property, everything that you have, you have to make sure that you remove leavening. So in regards to the question specifically that if you can't control what's coming into the house overall, then you just do the best you can because it says that the person that's going to be cut off is the one that actually eats the leavened bread. So as long as you keep yourself straight from the leaven, from leavened bread for those seven days, you'll be okay. Give me another Pesach. A second one if people miss the first one. But Pesach would be the actual offering that we perform. So the only way you're going to miss the Pesach offering or Passover offering is if you are unclean by the dead, or as it mentioned in the book of Numbers, on a journey. So there, was, there were individuals that were unclean by reason of the dead. This is the book of Numbers chapter... Okay, this is before we left that. This should be chapter 9. Numbers chapter 9, yeah, Numbers chapter 9, it mentions the second, uh, it mentions a second Passover. Now, a second Passover is not a second Feast of Eleven Bread. The Feast of Eleven Bread will always be in the first month from the 15th day of the month to the 21st day of the first month. The second Passover would take place on the 14th day of the second month for those that were not able to take part in the Passover in the first month because, again, as it mentioned in Numbers chapter 9, that they were unclean by the dead or on a journey where they were not able to partake of or perform the Passover offering in the first month, and that's why they were given an occasion and ability to do so in the second month. But again, it doesn't replace the Feast of Eleven Bread. So even if a person is unclean by the dead or they're on a journey, they will still have to keep the Feast of Eleven Bread in the first month because they would not get another opportunity to do so in the second month. Mm -hmm. In terms of the question, the question is in terms of um, connotation that people give, is there a difference between the Israelite and the Jew? Now, in terms of the word Israel, Israel will encompass the entire nation, all of the children of Israel who come out of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because Jacob's name would change to Israel, so everybody that's born of Jacob would be an Israelite, as we would say in, Eng in English, or B'nai Yisrael, as you would say in Hebrew on the children of Israel, so that would be an Israelite. The term Jew would come from the terminology of just focusing on the tribe of Judah, who was the southern kingdom, who after a period of time became, a, lack of a better term, nation unto themselves, and that's where after the northern tribes were taken away in captivity, after the split of the nation into two kingdoms, then you had the northern tribes taken into captivity by the Assyrians. All that was left behind was the tribe of Judah. Now, within the tribe of Judah, or, the, or more accurately, the territory of Judah, because within the territory of Judah, you had other tribes. You had Levites there. You had the tribe of Benjamin, as we read historically. We had the Levites that were there. You had other tribes that may have been able to escape from the Assyrian captivity that dwelt within the territory of Judah. So now other nations viewed that territory as Judah. So they would call everybody that was within that territory 
um, Yehudi in terms of the Hebrew. Well, in Hebrew, we would say Yehudi, but that terminology of Jew would just refer to everybody that is from that territory of Judah. Just like we read in the book of Esther, where Mordecai is of the tribe of Benjamin, but he was recognized as a Jew because he came from that kingdom, because again, the northern tribes were already in captivity. So in terms of the concept, yes, there's a difference between the Israelite and Jew, the Jew or which coming from the territory of Judah would only be a portion of Israel overall, but Israel is the entire nation. So on the technical aspect, yes, there is a difference, but those of Judah are part of Israel. And any other questions? It's a grain, so that itself would be safe to eat for. The question was in terms of um, people pronounce it differently, so I'll just spell it. Q-U-I-N-O-A. -Q Some people say quino, quinoa, people. Quinoa, are you sure? It's quinoa, yeah. <laughs> See, your brother says quinoa. <laughs> However it's pronounced, it's okay for the Feast of Eleven Bread. It is a grain. In this morning's question, it said that they had to take um, the bird or whatever into an unclean place. What mm. would be that unclean place? It would just be a place that would be designated. For unclean? Like what kind of place? Um, Is it city or uncleanness? Well, not even an active city, just a territory that's unclean. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give reference to um, something more recent. No, yeah, yeah, put it like that. Like a like a garbage dump. Okay, like a sanitation. Yeah, like a sanitation. Yeah, that's that's yeah. yeah. It'd be like a yeah a sanitation dump because that would be an unclean place. So it'd be a place that's designated just for for stuff. It would never be clean, but it's designated for things like that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, the question was, can you eat corn? And the, the answer is yes. Assumption you're being meaning for Feast of Eleven Bread as opposed to throughout the year. But either way, yeah, yes. So the problem with corn flakes is because it's a, so based on, and we're going to relate to how we, you know, how it's taught in this congregation. The idea is to stay away from processed foods because we're not in those facilities to know exactly what they do to process those foods. So we don't know what um, trace elements of whatever that we're not supposed to be able to eat could affect any of that processed food. So by virtue of that, we don't eat um, cereal or anything like that during the, um, those seven days. So it's not, you know, nothing wrong with, you know, because it's too generic of a term to say don't eat processed food. It's better to explain why we say uh, we don't eat processed foods. But if you buy your corn and you figure out in your own house how to turn corn into flakes. If you know how that mechanism works, then yeah, we can't tell you that it'd be wrong. And we'll come to your house and get some cereal. You just, yeah, that's actually better because you, the untouched, the question is about unbleached flour. Untouched flour, you want pure flour. So you want everything to where you read the ingredients and 100%. No, well, flour initially doesn't have leavening in it. But if you want to stay away from the flours that have the paragraph of ingredients on it. Right. Right. You want the, wheat, yeah, 100% wheat flour. There's nothing wrong with that, yeah. Also, bearing in mind, even with water, be careful during the season. There are waters that have baking soda in it. Right. So these are just some of the things to be mindful of during the season. So the observance of Passover for this congregation and related congregations will be this Monday evening. No, actually, for the Kagmatsu would be this Monday evening because uh, the Passover sacrifice would actually take place if we're not able to do offerings. So we're not actually doing Passover. 
just for clarification, it would take place on Monday before sundown if we were able to do the offering. Because Passover itself, when you read in Le Leviticus chapter 23, is not a day. It's actually the time that you perform the offering. Right. I was just going to ask, mm -hmm. can you explain that? Because a lot of people don't know that um, Pesach does not go into the night. Right, because the, sac the sacrifice would be performed before sun goes down, that entire roasting process. So it's just throughout the process of, a process of time, the Feast of Eleventh Bread became erroneously mentioned or erroneously called Passover. Because again, Passover is not a day, it's a reference to the animal that is slaughtered on the 14th day of the, of the first month at dusk before sundown. And all that process would take done, you would eat the animal that you roast that night, which is when the Feast of Eleventh Bread actually begins. So it's actually a difference between Passover and the Feast of Eleventh Bread, but again, Many of the calendars that we buy out there today will say first day of Passover, second day, but there's no, it's not even a first day of Passover. It's just something that takes place on a particular day. So what is dusk? Dusk is the period of time before sun goes down where you see some darkness comes in. That's where the animal be. It would, it would be enough time to where you would slaughter the animal and be able to roast it. And there's also, when you think, when it also it's a terminology in Hebrew, it's called Bain Ha'ad Bayim which is a period of time it could take, there's no, you know, living in that time, people knew exactly what it was. So it was more difficult to explain it to now, but just comparing it to various um, portions that we read within scripture, the Torah itself and also in um, prophecy that you would have two offerings per day. And it mentions one in the morning and one at dusk. That's, a day for, that's for the daily sacrifices. And both take a period of time between the slaughter of the animal and the roasting of the animal on the altar. So that's how you, you get the, the concept or the, the idea of, of the dust period being like two hours, two to three hours. Even in um, later history, when you're reading of, of the children of Israel, even like in the book of Josephus, it will mention that it would be like about two to, two to three hours. Would be that two to, two to three hours before sundown would be that period of dusk. So you're saying that the would last about two hours? The slaughter, between the slaughter and the roasting, yeah. Because think about when we were in Egypt, we had to slaughter it, roast it, and then eat it that night. So it had to be ready to eat that night. Because um, ancient people didn't have you know, kitchens inside the homes. Everything was done outside, so everything had to be done to bring the food in, or to bring that animal, the, the cooked animal in for sundown. Yeah. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, some congregations, the question is in terms of staying, spending the night uh, for Kagma, so there's nothing wrong with that. Um, is the grateful clean now? Is a... Is the grateful? Yeah, we can't turn an unclean thing into a clean thing. And it's not unclean, technically, it's just... <laughs> huh? No, that's why I don't. That's why I said it's not. We just made the joke after, but it's not an unclean thing. It's just something that we would not be permitted to eat. The question is in regards to great food. So in Leviticus chapter 19, it mentions, and this is where once we start to get into this, other people bring up other fruits and other things that come into play. But we know for sure in regards to the great fruit. So we're going to focus on the great fruit for now, on where it mentions in Leviticus chapter 19. Verse 19, you shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with two kinds of seed. Neither shall there come upon thee a garment of two kinds of stuff mingled together. Also in Deuteronomy chapter 22, it should be. Just to read it in conjunction with what we just read there. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 9, which gets more specific. Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with two kinds of seed, lest the fullness of the seed which thou hast grown, which thou hast sown, be forfeited together with the increase of the vineyard. Yeah, we'll stop there. So, as a result of that, we're not allowed to put two types of seed together, and the grapefruit is not something that was, that was naturally occurring. It was a human invention um, of the pomelo fruit and the sweet orange, which they mixed the seeds together in order to make the grapefruit because the pomelo, which is still available today, many people still eat, it tastes um, just like a grapefruit, 
However, it has much more flesh on the inside than the grapefruit. So there were some individuals that did not like cutting through all of that flesh. So in order to avoid cutting through all that flesh, they said, let's mix this fruit with an orange, which has less flesh, and get a pomelo, which has less flesh, which became the grapefruit. And it, at times went on, the grapefruit also became patented. That just shows it was an invention. You, know, you usually don't get to patent something that God already made. So the grapefruit became a patent. So it was something that was created by mankind. Was that it? Uh, Intentionally, right. Intentionally. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I would say, again, I just preface in my opinion. If it was not made on purpose and it just was naturally occurring, as you mentioned, there are different methods, cross-pollination, different things that happen naturally, then it's not, it wasn't an individual intentionally breaking the law of God where they took two seeds and put it together. Um, and also, that process of cross pollination is not is technically not the mixing of the two seeds where you don't put two seeds. It just happened, right? It happened, so that would be okay. As opposed to, and you know, somebody saying, "I want to make something," and they take two seeds. And God didn't say it won't happen. He just said that the fruit of their row would be forfeited. So therefore, when they mix the two seeds of the, or well, they mix the seeds of the pomelo with the um, sweet orange, then the fruit that comes up would be forfeited. Because God, again, didn't say that the, what produced won't, won't happen. He just said whatever pr is produced will be forfeited or an abomination, but not unclean. So if you touch a grapefruit, you're not unclean until the evening. Same thing. Yeah. Orange is good. But certain types of oranges, because you also got to be careful with... Certain types of oranges, because some oranges, some species, for lack of a better term, of oranges were tampered with. So, yeah, you want to, when you get an orange, you want an orange. Mm hmm. No, I'm just saying, when, what we read here, God said, don't mix the seeds because the fruit thereof would be forfeited. So, it doesn't mean that what comes out won't happen and won't have seeds by themselves, God said that we're not supposed to partake of those things. Yeah. Yeah, some, so for this congregation, the teaching is that wine is okay. For the question out there, for, cog, for Kogmatso. So the teaching of the congregation is, the, well, for many congregations, actually, that wine is okay. The, the focus is on wines that are made kosher for Passover that doesn't have the yeast or flack of, for, don't have the wine store, the process with, where they use yeast in the process of making the wine, then those would be wrong. But for this and various congregations that if you, like if you make your own wine without doing any tampering with it, then it would be okay. That would be a long list to <laughs> figure out what's okay and what's not okay. But no, Taya. Yeah. So, like, the fruits and seeds. Mm -hmm. So, I know, like, in the Genesis, you know, like, you know, all the thing about, like, human activity and fruit-yielding seeds. Mm -hmm. Is that, like, like, really a restriction on fruits without seeds? Or is that, like, a genocide based on that statement? So, very good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so the question is in regards to because in the book of Genesis it said that God gave us the fruit or no God gave or God made the fruits bearing or, or yielding seeds somewhere along the line again so just for the sake of anybody getting upset I'll preface it by saying my opinion again but somewhere along the line there came a teaching along with that that we have to eat fruits that have seeds where that came from, I don't exactly know, but somewhere along the line that became a teaching in terms of we're commanded to do so. Now, it's in our best interest to do so, 
But in terms of your question specifically, it's not written as a command. It's just something that um, is part of the package of blessings if you think about it. Because where it says, well, where God says to mankind, be fruitful and multiply. Now, some people will say it's a command to be fruitful and multiply as opposed to where it says God blessed them saying be fruitful and multiply. So the ability to be fruitful and multiply is actually a blessing as opposed to a command. So the same thing will apply to like the fruits. It's the, the blessing that these fruits are able to produce seed and continue on their own reproduction because God only made those fruits once. So that's the blessing of that as opposed to saying that's the command to do so. But it's in our best interest to focus on fruits that do have the seeds because then you sort of minimize what has been tampered with. But it doesn't mean that completely because there are fruits that have been tampered with that will still have seeds. But it's a good place to start. So it's our best interest to do so. But just to give a clear separation between what's the actual command and what's in our best interest to do. And then... Oh, yeah, I think yeah, you had your hand up. Yeah. So the question is, in, oh, the question is in terms of, because at this congregation, just at the beginning of the question, at this congregation, uh, for the most part, we don't teach that there is a life after death. So the question is in regards to when King Saul went to seek out um, the prophet Samuel after Samuel died, and he wasn't getting the an answer from the Most High directly, so he decided to go to a witch. This is in First Samuel chapter. 28. Right, which is, right, that helps to answer that question. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, that's, that's oh, fine, that's fine. Okay. You could, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> that's actually the answer. So, I mean, that's why I say that's fine. But, so in First Samuel chapter 28, in the paraphrasing of what happened in the chapter, as Doratia mentioned, that King Saul didn't see what the witch brought up. And his communication was still through her. So that's the short answer to that is God gives people what they're looking for. So it doesn't mean that that was actually Samuel. But because, Samuel, because Saul was looking in an evil place to get an answer, God gave him exactly what he was looking for. Because even the, the witch apparently was surprised that she was able to, <laughs> to do that. And she didn't even know who it was. She described him, and then Saul said, oh, it must be Samuel. So there's a lot of um, gaps within that story that between Saul and the witch, it doesn't connect. And even that, and, right, and, 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 at, and at that moment, God could make something. Because if you're looking for something, God can make it happen. So it doesn't mean that those things exist. But if in your mind you think they exist, then God could give that to you and then still test you with it. It's like in, it's like in the book of Deuteronomy where you have false prophets. And God said that, you know, how you know that it's a false prophet? Because whatever they speak doesn't come to pass. So God can test you, and he also, he also can test you where there is a prophet that is false and says something that actually comes to pass, but they're directing you away from the Most High. And God said that he only made that happen to see if you're going to follow him or not. So it doesn't mean that that false prophet has the power to do anything, but God is causing certain things to happen just to see what you would do. Yeah, they're supposed to die. That's why yeah, King Saul killed, had everybody killed, and then he started looking for one he, because he was like, there got to be one somewhere because he said, Fair, I know y'all didn't listen to me completely. So he said, there got to be some, someone somewhere because he was, he was basically panicking at this moment. And 
So that's what, what, what happened. So in 1 Samuel chapter 28, starting from verse 9, and Saul disguised himself and, or any, well, real quick, and Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment and went he and two of the men with him and they came to the woman by night and he said, divine unto me, I pray thee by a ghost and bring me up whomsoever I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, behold, I know what Saul have done, how he have cut off those that divine by a ghost or familiar spirit of the land, wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die. And Saul swore to her by Jehovah, saying, As Jehovah liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up to thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for, the, for what seest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I see a God like being coming up out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man come up of, and he is covered with a robe, and Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he bowed his face to the ground and prostrated himself, and then Saul proceeded to say on that thing that happened, that you will be with me tomorrow. That was the, um, the response that the Most High was given to Saul because of the evil act that he was doing at this time. And also in, in regards to that, a question always comes up because it's speaking about life after death. So... Saul perceived that it was Samuel because she said it was an old man coming up and he is covered with a robe. Do clothes have life after death? So how is this life after death wearing clothes? That's always a question that comes up. Like, where are these spirits getting these clothes from that they're wearing? Oh. <laughs> And do they change clothes? Or do they always have the same clothes when if somebody conjures up the same individual? Or do they always have the same clothes on all the time? Or, are they always, or do they wear the clothes that they were wearing when they died? Can These are the clothes. Huh? Can somebody actually do that? Cause or the dead? No. Are oh, you remembered? And by the way, were there any questions online? Because them, them might have known it. And we apologize because the screen is probably blowing up. And for lack of it, for, for, sorry for the people online, there's actually nobody monitoring the computer at all. So we don't even know if anybody's asking questions online. I figured there might have been a lot of questions, but we apologize. There was nobody watching the computer at all this whole time. Deja vu. No, 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 not that. Okay. You said all oh, this day happened before, but something like you could get a feel like a strong gut feeling mm -hmm. in your stomach, or like something comes over you and you be like, something bad is going to happen. Right. Something, you know how you get, and it's like extremely, extremely strong, and it happens. So, what do you think that could be? Intuition, and you know, which is, a, which is a different subject. It doesn't mean that people don't have intuition, but you know, that could be you know, intuition. Could be. It's like it's like dreams. Yeah. It's like when people have dreams, you know, most I could communicate with us through dreams as well. Actually let's try to because Chief O'Connor already brought up his bag. But there were a bunch of questions that were probably asked that we didn't um it wasn't a bunch of questions. Oh, it wasn't a lot? Okay. It was just Ricardo asking about David's mother and oh. All right. and David and a bunch of stuff. David's mother named but there was nothing else 
Yeah, that was a quest. We, so we, again, with um, the vinegar, wine, and everything like that, um, as far as this congregation is concerned, we stay away from that. Uh, apple cider vinegar, in and of itself, is not wrong, but don't go out in the store and buy it. Like, if you make it your, on your own, that's one thing, but we stay away from the stuff that's uh, made in the store because we don't have control of the process behind making it. So that would be the short answer for that. Any, anything that we... Anything that we miss, we apologize, and you could always text 347-922 or 622-9090, and, and the individual will, that has that phone will um, answer you immediately. When does the feast begin? Right, so um, Monday, Monday evening. Yeah. Monday, no, when does the feast begin? Monday evening. On bleach, all-purpose white flour, is it okay to use? They're asking the same questions you asked. Yes, that's, um, that's okay. Well, no, sorry. Because I'm thinking about the question I was just asked in terms of unbleached flour. So the flour, just make sure that it says 100%, 100% wheat flour. Sorry, not the all, because they mentioned all purpose in there. You want to stay away from the flowers that have stuff in it. Right, it has all that stuff. So, but the unbleached plain flour, yeah, that would be good for the Feast of um, Unleavened Bread. No self rising. So the spirit of no, no, what, what passed over what passed over um, Egypt was known as the destroyer, or also referenced as the angel of death, which is something that the Most High dispatched to kill all of the firstborn of Egypt. So that is still an entity that the Most High sent out. That is, is not something that has any independent power, but something that an entity that the Most High would have made for a specific purpose at that time. People use lemon, lime, salt. In water. In, wa in water. In water, yes. <laughs> so. Right. Question What does Malek Dawi mean when he says, and in sin my mother conceived me? Psalm 51. That might have been from before, right? What was that just asked? Because it, it was answered. Yeah, so that, yeah. Oh, so you answered some of these questions already. Yeah. Inadvertently. And the, the other question you could ask, from, you could answer from okay. tomorrow. Psalm 51 5 has nothing to do with Christianity. Christianity Monday evening. Yeah. Doctrine, doctrine. David mentioned born in the Nuti and so my mother conceived. Yes, that was, yeah, that was from earlier. When David's mother remarried, his father Jesse, Nachash attacked Yabesh Gilead, and Saul routed him, and he fled in hiding and abandoned his wife Nitzavet. That information is not in um, in the scripture. That case, when Rock Taylor got a question, and then. <laughs> it's a so the question is in regards to arranged marriages it's, it's not a bad practice it's something that um, has happened historically um, they have worked of course throughout history you know, whether they work in today's time as much, maybe, maybe not, that's going to be based on opinion, but there's nothing wrong with arranged, arranged marriages. But Chief Okwan is ready, so. So Monday, so Monday evening we'll have service here. Chief Uza will mention everything more in detail, but yes, Monday evening we'll have service here. We'll try to do it as close to 8 p.m. as possible, a little bit after 8 p.m., but that's, we'll try to do our best. I'm going to be giving announcements to the world. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I'm mentioning that. And then. I'm going to say the blessing. I'm going to sing the song. I'm going to be saying announcements to the world. Yeah. That's why I'm mentioning that now so for the people that have those questions. But we make sure that it's nice and dark and that we ain't in violation. Yes.
Cause some people them over here, boy, 